scriptures in hand and turn with me to Ezekiel 33. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 9 in just a moment. We're continuing our vision series for this year, City Changers 3, because it's the third year we've done a City Changers uh, series. And that's because God is calling us to change our city for Christ. Every one of us is being called to be a city changer. And this morning's message is titled Missional Living, Missional Living. You know, some time ago I had the privilege of going to China on a mission trip. And on one day off that we had, because during that 14-day period, we had one day off where they took us around and we did some sightseeing. And they took us to the Great Wall of China, which is one of the wonders of the world, the only man-made structure that is visible from outer space. It is massive, stretching for more than 13,000 miles along the northern border of China. And they built the wall to keep invaders out. And they built it so high that no one could get over it. And they built it so thick that no one could tunnel through it. The humongous wall was begun in the third century, and it still exists today. We were able to climb a, a, a portion of it. But in the first hundred years of its existence, China was invaded three times. The enemy didn't come over the wall, and the enemy didn't tunnel through the wall. Rather, each time China was invaded, the enemy came through a gate in the wall, opened to them by a guard or watchman who had been bribed. Because the watchman failed to do his duty, the enemy invaded their land and many lives were lost. The role of a watchman was vital in ancient times, and God tells us that the job of a spiritual watchman is a vital role throughout time. Read with me, if you will, Ezekiel 33, verses 1 through 9. The prophet said, once again, a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, give your people this message. When I bring an army against a country, the people of that land choose one of their own to be a watchman. When the watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn the people. Then if those who hear the alarm refuse to take action, it is their own fault if they die. They heard the alarm, but ignored it. So the responsibility is theirs. If they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. But if the watchman sees the enemy coming and doesn't sound the alarm to warn the people, he is responsible for their captivity. They will die in their sins, but I will hold the watchman responsible for their deaths. Wow. Verse 7. Now, son of man, I am making you a watchman for the people of Israel. Therefore, listen to what I say and warn them for me. If I announce that some wicked people are sure to die and you fail to tell them to change their ways, then they will die in their sins and I will hold you responsible for their death. Let me just put a caveat in here. Don't go to a church that preaches what is politically correct because you will die in your sins. Go to a church that preaches what is biblically correct. I know that's villainized now in our society. It's called controversial subject matter and is being banned on TV and being banned on social media. But regardless, we need to speak the truth of God's word, both as a church and individually. Amen? Praise the Lord. So that's just an extra sermon, no extra charge. So he says, if I announce that some wicked people are sure to die and you fail to tell them to change their ways, then, you, then they will die in their sins and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. I don't want God to hold me responsible because I didn't speak the truth. Amen. Verse nine. But if you warn them to repent and they don't repent, they will die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself. You know, it was the job of a watchman to station himself at a high point on the wall of a city. And sometimes they would even build uh, watchtowers on the wall of the city to, to give an even higher or more elevated point uh, of sight for the watchman to be able to see off into the horizon if there was an invading force coming. And although watchmen announced the arrival of dignitaries, if a king or, or a ruler was approaching a city, he would announce their arrival. But the primary job of a watchman was to stand guard, constantly scanning the horizon for any enemy, for any uh, uh, threat or danger approaching. And if he spotted the enemy, he was to take the trumpet and he was to blow it loudly as a warning to the people. The watchman's service to his city was a matter of life 
and death. If he failed to see the enemy or to issue a warning for any reason, some people would be killed. In fact, many would be killed. However, if he faithfully fulfilled his job, spotted the enemy, and warned the city, many of the lives of his people could be saved because the people of the city would have time to respond, to arm themselves, to mount a defensive action and have the chance to save their lives and save their city or their nation from destruction and law. Whoever was appointed as watchman had to be dependable, faithful, and trustworthy, not like the guards keeping the wall of China that got bribed, amen? You have to be dependable, faithful, and trustworthy because the lives of the people were relying on him. He had to be alert, sacrificing to stay awake when everybody else was home, comfortable in their bed, sleeping. The watchman had to be vigilant, understanding the seriousness of their purpose and dedicating themselves fully to it. And even though the message of warning was not one that people wanted to hear, nobody wants to be woken up in the middle of the night by a trumpet saying the enemy is coming. It's not a message that people wanted to hear. It was not a pleasant message or a popular mes message. He had to be completely committed to giving that message whenever it was necessary, no matter the disturbance or cause. The watchman had a vital mission, and that mission was to save his city by watching and warning. In this passage, God appoints Ezekiel to this very significant and serious duty as a spiritual watchman. He was to be on spiritual watch and to issue a warning of God's message, the message of God's judgment through the invasion of a foreign nation. He was a man on a mission. And you say, well, what does that have to do with us? That was Ezekiel. Well, Ezekiel was a prophet, right? And the word prophet in Hebrew, it, it, it was the word navi, it means seer. And their primary role was to be in tune with God, to see in their spirit what was happening and what God was doing, and to then speak forth the message that they received from God. Today, we are called to be a prophetic people. So we are God's appointed watchmen over our city and our nation. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, Peter declared that this was a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, that in the last days I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. God has called his church to be a prophetic people, to speak forth his message, to warn of impending judgment. That's us, folks. God has poured out his spirit on us that we might be a prophetic people. And a key aspect of being a prophetic people is that God has set us to be watchmen, spiritual watchmen over our city and nation. He has given us a vital mission and the lives of many people, the lives of the people in our city, the lives of the people in this nation depends on us faithfully discharging our duty as watchmen. Our mission involves a twofold responsibility, to watch and to warn. Turn to your neighbor and say, to watch and to warn. Now say it again like you mean it, to watch and to warn. But what exactly does that mean? Watching was always coupled with prayer. Watching has to do with intercession. Warning has to do with evangelism. So the spiritual watchman is an intercessor. The spiritual watchman watches and prays. Do you ever notice how many times Jesus used the phrase watch and pray together? The night of his arrest, hours before he went to the cross, Jesus took the disciples with him into the garden of Gethsemane to pray. And he went a little bit further and he prayed for a while. And when he returned to his disciples, they weren't being faithful watchmen. They were asleep. And, and he told them to pray again, went away. This happened three times he came back and found them sleeping. And in Matthew 26, verses 40 and 41, he said to them, couldn't you watch? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? And then he exhorted them to keep watch and pray, lest they would fall into temptation. Earlier in his ministry, while prophesying about the end times, he exhorted his followers to watch and pray that they might be counted worthy to escape the terrible things that would happen in the end time. So watch and pray was a constant 
commission, a constant commandment that Jesus gave to his followers. And the Greek word watch means to have the alertness of a night guard. That's the literal translation, to have the alertness of a night guard. And being a night watchman requires a greater vigilance than a daytime guard. During the day, danger can be easily spotted from a distance. And, and have you ever noticed that most crime takes place at night? Criminals don't tend to be as bold to try to uh, commit crime during the day. Most of that stuff happens at night under the cloak of darkness. Just as most of what is taking place in the world today is the activity of darkness, spiritual darkness. But during the daytime, danger can be easily spotted from a distance. But in the dark of night, watchmen must be especially alert and they must rely on other senses besides sight to be able to detect a threat or danger. The night watchman must be especially perceptive, relying on a keen sense of sound and relying on their internal instincts. What God calls every believer to watch and pray, and we are in a period of extreme darkness. It is a call to be a spiritual night watchman. To not rely only on what we see in the natural, but to be spiritually alert, keen to see the activity and the attacks of the enemy against God's people and against God's purpose. And the enemy often comes disguised. But when we spend time regularly in prayer, it develops a spiritual sensitivity in us that enables us to recognize and respond to attacks from the enemy even before they become evident, even before they occur. God will give us spiritual eyes to see when the enemy has come in or to perceive when something is not right, when, when darkness is at work, whether it's in our nation, in our city, in our family, in, in our home, in our lives, and, and, and you sense this, this uh, that something is just not right. You sense this check in your spirit, this disturbance in your spirit, and, and we must have spirits that are attuned to the spirit of God so that we can sense what is happening in the spirit realm. We have to have ears that are tuned to the spirit of God so that we can hear what God is saying in a given situation. The prophet Habakkuk, I know it's one of your favorite Old Testament books. Hey, man, you've got it memorized and it's worn out in your Bible. And I'm just, I'm just joking. Some of us don't spend a lot of time in the Old Testament prophets, but they are so rich in, in spiritual truth that is relevant for today. But the prophet Habakkuk understood his role as a spiritual watchman. And in Habakkuk 2.1, he says, I will climb up on my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Later, God would say to him, he would speak to him and he would tell him, write the message so you can run and deliver it. Because a spiritual watchman not only watches, but he warns, he brings the message of God. Well, the spiritual watchman, though, from Habakkuk, we see that the spiritual watchman has to spend time waiting on the Lord. In Amos 3, 7, it tells us that God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets, to his spiritual watchmen. And remember, we are called to be a prophetic people. So that verse is speaking to us that God will do nothing without revealing his secret to his prophets. But to be a prophet, you have to spend time to tune your spirit to God's spirit and hear what God is saying. God is calling us to such an intimacy of relationship with him that he can share with us the secrets of his kingdom, the secrets of what is happening in the spiritual realm in the world so that he can share with us the secrets of, of his plans and his purposes and what he is doing and what he desires to do. What we also see is a spiritual watchman wrestles in prayer for the plans and purposes of God to be fulfilled on earth. The reason a watchman is needed is because of the threat of enemy attack and invasion. If there wasn't a threat, there'd be no need for a watchman. Paul reminds us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness at work in high places. And he concludes his teaching on spiritual warfare, telling us that we need to pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching, there's that connection between praying and watching, and watching thereunto with all perseverance 
endurance and supplication for all saints. But did you notice that prayer where he talked, that, that phrase where he talked about prayer and supplication in the spirit? Did you know that that phrase, praying in the spirit, is unique to Paul? And it refers to praying in tongues. Praying in tongues. When we pray in tongues, the Spirit is praying through us for things that we don't know how to pray for or may not even be aware that we need to be praying for. But the Spirit knows the mind of God and intercedes through us according to the will of God. Many years ago, we had one of the missionaries that we supported for years that ministered here. His name was Jay Reisner, and he was a missionary to the continent of Africa. And he traveled through several countries doing leadership training for the leaders in those countries. And he often had to leave his family on, on the mission compound alone in Africa without him there. And one night when he was away, an armed group of men attacked the compound, cutting through the fence and breaking down the door of the house. One of those men later got saved and confessed to Jay Reisner that their intent that night was to rape his wife, kill his family, and steal whatever they could from the mission's compound. But this man that became a Christian testified, he says, as we were breaking down the door of the house, a group of armed soldiers drove up in jeeps and we fled. And he asked Jay Reisner, he said, where did you get those soldiers from? The fact is, there were no soldiers on the compound. But there was an angelic appearance that night that scared the criminals away. And months later, Jay Reisner was back in America ministering in a church, I believe in California, that supported he and his family as missionaries. And after the service, a couple came to him and asked what was happening on such a date at such a time. And it was the very night that this attack was taking place. And the man said to Jay Reisner, he said, that night, my wife and I were awakened to intercede in the spirit for you. And we prayed all night for you and your family. That couple was appointed that night to be spiritual watchmen for Jay Reisner and his family. And because they obeyed, their lives were spared. Folks, this is life and death. This is real. And the prophet Isaiah gives us a glimpse of, of the perseverance in prayer that is expected of a spiritual watchman. He says in Isaiah 62, 6 through 7, he says, I have posted watchmen on your walls. This is God speaking. I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. You see, in this verse, the prophet Isaiah is describing to us God speaking through him, the perseverance that is needed of a spiritual watchman. He says, they will never be silent day or night. Does that describe your intercession? Does that describe the way that you pray and intercede for the people of God, for the city, for our nation? He says, you who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest until, until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. See, what he's telling us is the spiritual watchman wrestles in prayer against the forces of darkness. The spiritual watchman perseveres until the enemy is defeated and the purposes of God and the people of God are established. A spiritual watchman is an intercessor. We are called to intercede for our nation. We are called to intercede for our city. We are called to intercede for our church. We are called to intercede for our families. Lives depend on it. So a spiritual watchman is an intercessor, but a spiritual watchman is also an evangelist. You see, the spiritual watchman is charged with warning the people. The primary role of the watchman is to watch and then to warn when he sees the impending threat. The watchman was to pick up his trumpet and sound the alarm of impending danger. People today face a twofold danger. Satan
Satan is actively at work destroying lives, destroying our nation through sin and immorality. But there is a second danger, impending judgment that is coming upon all who have not received Christ. And that day of judgment is fast approaching. You might say, Pastor, that is a very dark message. Isn't that evangelist supposed to bring good news, preach the gospel? Yes, Yes, but the gospel is good news because it saves us from the bad news. I love what one Bible college professor said in our evangelism class many years ago. He said, you can't get a person saved until you first get them lost. Unless they know they're lost, then they're not going to be open to receive a Savior. People need to understand the danger that they're in in order to see their need of a Savior. And I'm not telling you to go out and be obnoxious or to be hateful. We can speak the truth in love. And that's what God calls us to do, to speak the truth in love. So I don't want to commission anybody to go out of here with some kind of doom and gloom, condemnatory spirit, you know, bless the Lord, you're a sinner, and you're going to hell on a banana peel. That's not what I'm talking about. Amen? We can speak the truth in love, but we need to speak the truth. I see a lot of people, because of political pressure now, backing down from speaking the truth. Just a couple of weeks ago, I shared with you uh, uh, the story of a well-known uh, minister and, and Christian author who was banned from a church in Washington, D.C. because he had spoken uh, against um, uh, the homosexual lifestyle in previous messages. As a result, he issued an apology. He issued an apology. And, and, and it just broke my heart that this man who is a well-known and respected minister and Christian author would back down from the truth of God's word because of political pressure. And, and, and we're going to see this more and more because there's going to be a clear line drawn, a clear line drawn. The Bible says that in the end times, there's going to be a great apostasy, a great falling away. But at the same time, there's going to be a revival. There's going to be a remnant. There's going to be a people who are faithful. And the line is going to be clearly drawn. And I see, I believe the pressure that we're seeing in society is God is using it to draw that line clearly because there has been too much compromise in the church. But the spiritual watchman is charged with warning the people. And the spiritual watchman is charged with delivering God's message. Again, I'm not saying to be a messenger of doom and gloom proclaiming meaning turn or burn, repent or, or die. But the gospel message in a nutshell is John 3, 16. We all know that verse, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. That's good news, right? The good news is God loves you. God wants to give you eternal life. You can be forgiven. But did you notice in the midst of that good news, there was some bad news? We find that bad news is that without Christ, we are perishing. Without Christ, if we would read on in that passage, it says, those who believe not are condemned already. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn anyone, but that those who believe not are condemned already. So right there in a passage of the best news ever, for God so loved the world, we also find the bad news that all mankind is perishing in sin apart from Christ. But did you notice how positively Jesus phrased it? The bad news is so positively phrased that sometimes we overlook it when we quote that verse, don't we? The, the emphasis was not on the bad news, but on a good God who gave his only son to pay the penalty we deserved and offers us all forgiveness and eternal life. So we need to proclaim the message clearly, confidently, that we are all sinners. But we need to do it graciously, we need to do it respectfully, and we need to do it lovingly because we need people not to shut us down but to hear the message because it is the power of God unto salvation. And if they respond in faith, they will be saved. But to respond in faith, they have to hear. They have to hear. And if we come across obnoxiously or hatefully or, or in a condemnatory way, what do people do? They shut us down. In order to believe, we have to hear. Faith comes 
by hearing, by hearing. So we need to proclaim the message clearly and confidently, but we need to do it graciously. And if they respond in faith, they will be saved. If they reject the message tragically, the Bible says that's on them. Once they've heard it, if they reject it, that's their choice. That's on them. But we have done what God has called us to do. But if we don't tell them and they die in their sin, then what did God say? He'll hold us responsible. That's a serious charge, amen? We can't save anyone, but we are called to proclaim the message to everyone. We can't save anyone, but we are called to preach the message to everyone. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. What is an ambassador? It's someone that is appointed by a king or ruler to represent them in foreign territory. Isn't that right? We are Christ's ambassadors. He has appointed us to represent him in the territory of darkness, this earth. And it goes on to say, as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are Christ's representatives to this world. God is making his appeal to the unsaved through us. We are to be his mouthpiece, pleading with the world to come to God and be made right with him. It is a message of love. It is a message of grace. It is a message of forgiveness. It is a message of hope that saves us from our sin when we repent and place our faith in him. God loves you. God is for you and not against you. That's the message. God wants a relationship with you. That's the message. God wants to spend eternity with you. That's the message. God wants to work in your life now and give you the best life possible because that's what he does for all of those who trust in him. That is the message. But we are all sinners and we are cut off from God. That is the message. But Jesus died for us that through him, when we repent of our sins and place our faith in him, we might be saved and we might have eternal life. That is our message to the world. And God calls us to deliver it faithfully, realizing that lives depend on it both now and for eternity. God is calling each and every one of us to be spiritual watchmen to intercede for our families, our church, our city, our nation, to stand watch in prayer and wrestle against the attacks of the enemy until they are defeated and God's purpose is established. God is calling us to be his messengers, his mouthpiece, through whom he makes his appeal to this city, to our families, to our loved ones, to this nation, to come and be reconciled to him through Christ. Lives depend on it. And so this week, I want to exhort you to be a watchman. God has appointed you to be a watchman. And in a very practical way, how are we going to apply that? I want to challenge you to pray five minutes daily for three people in your sphere of influence who do not know Christ. Do spiritual battle for their souls. I encourage you to write down those three names. Could be family members, could be friends, could be co-workers, etc. Write down those three names that God lays on your heart now and then commit to pray for them. Be a spiritual watchman over their soul for the next 30 days. Pray five minutes a day for those three people. From now until Easter, we're one month out from Easter. Amen. Pray that the Holy Spirit will work in their heart. Pray that the forces of darkness that are holding them in bondage to sin would be broken. Pray that the spiritual blinders with which Satan has blinded their eyes so that they cannot see the truth would be removed and that the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ would be able to penetrate into their soul. Pray against every evil influence, every lie of the enemy that is holding them captive that they might be set free to believe the truth. Intercede for them every day, five minutes a day for the next 30 days. See, it's not enough just to hear the word, but we need to be doers of the word. 
So we need to find ways to practically apply the sermon. Amen? Not enough just to agree with it. Not enough just to say amen. But we need to practically apply the sermon. And so this is one way that we can practically apply the sermon. So you're going to pray for them from now till Easter. And, and then come up on Easter. You're going to invite them to join you either in person or online for our Easter service so that they can hear the good news. Amen. We can all do that, can't we? Amen. Praise the Lord. And for those of you who have not yet placed your faith in Jesus, repented of your sins and received God's wonderful gift of eternal life, I want you to know that God loves you, that you're not hearing this message by accident, but God is reaching out to you because he wants a relationship with you. And yes, we have all sinned. There is such a thing as sin. We have all sinned, and sin cuts us off from God. But no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God loves you, and he has made a way for you to be forgiven of your sins and saved from the judgment to come. What is that way? His name is Jesus. He came from heaven to earth. He lived a sinless life. He gave his life on the cross, taking the penalty of sin that we deserve, that through him we might be forgiven and we might be made right with God. That's the love of God. That's the goodness of God towards us. So that now when we repent of our sins, and the word repent simply means to turn away from, we recognize we've been heading in the wrong direction. The direction we've been going leads to destruction, and we immediately make a 180-degree turn, say, I don't want to live that way anymore, Lord. I turn away from that, and I turn to you. That's repentance, and we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And that instant, God forgives us. We are born again. We are made spiritually alive, and we become a child of God, and we can have the confidence to know that we are right with him and that we have eternal life. And if you have not yet prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, or maybe you did so some time ago and you've drifted away and you know it's time to come back, then I want to invite you to pray a simple prayer with me. It's not my words. My words are not special, but it's your heart in sincerity, meaning what you pray as you repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ. So if you want to be reconciled to God, if you want to be forgiven, if you want to be made right with God and become a child of God, would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. And I believe that you love me so much that you died for my sins. Today, I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent. I turn away from my sin. And I turn to you. I ask you to forgive me. And I invite you to come live inside of me. Help me from this day forth to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God has done exactly what you asked him to do. And we want to say congratulations. You've made the best decision of your life. And we welcome you to the family of God. You that are listening to us online, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, that prayer was a beginning, not an ending. It's the beginning of a wonderful, lifelong relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to help you to grow in that relationship. So we want to ask you just to type right now in the comments, I prayed. Why? Because we want to congratulate you. We want to welcome you. But most importantly, we want to send you free of charge a little e-booklet that's going to help you understand the prayer you just made and know the next steps that you need to take to keep growing in this relationship with the Lord. We want to send that to you free of charge. So please type, I prayed, in the comments right now. And later this day, somebody will send you a message with a link. Click that link, fill in your name and email address so that we can email uh, this free e-booklet to you. So do that right now and while you're doing that I just want to give you three quick steps that you can take to keep growing in the Lord one talk to God every day that's what we call prayer you don't need any special language talk to him as you would a best friend that you could tell anything to begin by thanking him for all the good things in your life because every blessing every good thing in our life comes from him so begin by thanking him and then uh, invite him to work in your life in any area that you're having struggles or problems or difficulties just turn them over to God ask him uh, to help you in those 
those areas and ask him to help you to grow in your relationship with him. Secondly, let God speak to you every day. How does God speak to us? The number one way is through the Bible. It's his word. It's his message to us. So read the Bible every day. If you don't have a printed version, download the YouVersion app on your phone. It's free of charge. You can read it there. They also have some wonderful little Bible studies that will help you understand God more and what God wants to do in your life. But start first by reading in the Bible. I want to encourage you to read in 1 John. It's a short book in the New Testament, just five chapters. Read a few verses every day before you read. Ask God to help you understand what you're reading and what it means for you. Even take a notebook and just uh, jot down uh, the thoughts of, of, of that are being impressed on your heart of what God is saying to you. And then thirdly and finally, I want to encourage you to get connected to a local Assembly of God church. Of course, if you're here in South Florida, we want to invite you to come and get connected here. We have a wonderful church family that will walk alongside of you and help you to grow in your relationship with the Lord. But if you're outside of the South Florida area, then we encourage you to find an Assembly of God church near to you. Start attending, get connected so that you can keep growing in this wonderful new relationship that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Congratulations again and welcome to the family of God. For those of us who have already placed our faith in Christ, I want you to stop for a moment and just allow God to speak to your heart and lay on your heart the names of three people in your life that do not know Christ. And if you're willing to commit to pray for them five minutes a day for the next 30 days through Easter, and then as we come up on Easter and we're praying for the Spirit to work in their life and convict them and draw them to Christ, and then that week before Easter, won't you invite them to join us online or, or in person, help them to make a re reservation if they need to, and invite them to come to church with you on Easter. If you're willing to make that commitment, would you stand to your feet right where you are, even you at home, stand to your feet before the Lord and make this commitment to him? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now, Lord God. Father, we are so grateful that somebody faithfully served as a watchman for our souls. Somebody prayed for us. Somebody prayed us through, Lord God, to salvation. Somebody wrestled with the forces of darkness on our behalf. And someone was your messenger to bring the gospel to us. We are so grateful for those someones who were faithful to their duty as a watchman. Father, we recognize today that you are appointing us to be a spiritual watchman, Lord God. And Father, we respond in faith today and we say, here I am, Lord. Use me. I will obey. I will be faithful to discharge the duty of being a spiritual watchman. Father, as we stand before you today, we are committing. We pray that you would just lay on our hearts the, the, the names of three people in our circle of influence that do not know you, whether it's a family member, a friend, a co-worker, the people that you are are dealing with even now, Lord. Father, lay them on our heart, oh God. And Father, as you do, we commit ourselves to pray for them at least five minutes a day for the next 30 days, Lord God, that you would work in their heart, that the Holy Spirit would deal with them and convict them of sin, that the blinders of, of, of spiritual darkness would be stripped from their eyes and the chains of sin's bondage broken over their lives. We commit to pray for them for the next 30 days. And, and as Easter approaches, Lord God, that week, we, we commit, Lord God, to, to speak up and invite them to join us for Easter service, whether online or in person. Father, we make this commitment to you, but we recognize that the flesh is weak, so we ask the help of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to stir us each and every day, to remind us of those three names and our commitment to pray, Lord God, and to draw us into the closet of prayer on their behalf. Father, we commit this to you, and through the help of your Holy Spirit, help us to faithfully discharge this duty over the next 30 days, Lord God. We thank you for everyone who makes this commitment today in Jesus' name, and we pray your blessing upon your people today. Those that are here, take them safely home. Surround everyone with your protection. Keep them healthy, keep them safe, and may they get good rest today in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and all God's people said amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for those who joined us by live stream. God bless you. We hope you have a wonderful week. We love you. We're praying for you and hope to see you in person soon. Have a great day.